So, um, welcome to the State of the Night ADRC in um, 2019. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, one of the great joys, privileges, and accomplishments of the Night ADRC is to uh, help train uh, and develop the next generation of Alzheimer uh, researchers. And uh, we have a number of summer students who are with us this summer. So Allison Long is from Hendricks University, and she's going to be doing her summer research fellowship with Greg Day. Ashley Valles Sermond is from Mahari, and she's going to be working with Joy Snyder. Amula Joseph uh, is from WashU, and she's going to be working with me and Suzanne Schindler. Uh, Adrienne Vasani, also from WashU, is going to be working with Brian Gordon. And Benson Joseph, also from Mahari Medical College, is going to be working with Eric McDade. And already started with us is someone working with Becky Fearberg as a, a social worker. It's Jen, uh, Shirley Lee. So thanks uh, to all of our students. Uh, I also want to indicate, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this in just a moment, that uh, we will not have a uh, night ADRC uh, Tuesday noon seminar to, uh, next Tuesday. I'll, I'll tell you why in a little bit. Alrighty, so uh, I have my disclosures here. And uh, this is the night ADRC faculty and staff as of 2000. In 15, so uh, some people have uh, are no longer with us. Others have joined us, but many of you will identify yourselves in this. It's a large group, 45 faculty, 85 st uh, 85 staff, and representing um, uh, 20 different departments, not just at the School of Medicine, but on the Danforth uh, campus as well. So interdisciplinary. And uh, of course, we are very much dependent for our research on our participants. And we have about <coughs> 900 uh, individuals who have been enrolled in the Knight ADRC and are still uh, active. So we're very uh, pleased to uh, always uh, acknowledge the commitment and dedication of our volunteers. We've had some additions to our group in the past uh, year since I last presented the State of the ADRC, uh, Anastasia is in the psychometric group, uh, uh, Amy Evans and Stacy Schrader are in the clinical trials unit, uh, David Gill is in the memory and aging project, Megan LaRose is in the psychometric group, and Marissa Streitz is in, a new social worker in the memory and aging project. Some individuals have uh, gone on to other things, and two individuals in particular I want to highlight, and that's uh, Jean Rubin, and Virginia Buckles at the end of this month. Uh, they are going to leave Memory and Aging Project Night ADRC. Virginia Buckles will officially retire as of June 30th, uh, 2019. And Gene Rubin is going to uh, start his phased retirement uh, beginning this July. Uh, Gene joined the Night ADRC in 1985, Virginia 1992. So they've been with us a long time, and each of them have made major uh, contributions to the program. Uh, I think I started uh, in the program perhaps in 1983. Uh, you know, my memory isn't so good anymore, so it's hard to tell when I actually started. Then Jean began with us, and Jean and I, along with the uh, budding night, uh, the ADRC at that time, uh, really uh, found uh, that we enjoyed uh, looking at the uh, clinical data and cognitive data uh, that we obtained from our participants and we each launched our uh, careers uh, in that in that way. Uh, also joining the Night ADRC in 1985 is Betsy Grant and uh, 1986 Mary Coates, where's Mary? They're, they're, they're still active with us and uh, 1989 uh, Terry Hostos, so Terry's raising her hand Terry, you're raising your hand, aren't you? Yes, good, all right. So uh, as I was mentioning earlier this morning, it's really a, a long standing group of very talented individuals that have built their careers and contributed uh, their uh, support uh, and uh, insights and uh, expertise to the Knight ADRC. Uh, because we won't have an opportunity, again, all of us uh, to get together like this, let's give Gene and Virginia a round of applause.
And the reason we're not having a night ADRC Tuesday noon seminar next Tuesday is because we're having a celebration for Virginia. It's going to be at the night ADRC conference room. Lunch will be served. Begins at 12. I think it goes till 2. So please come uh, join us and uh, wish uh, Virginia well in her retirement. All right, so just to make sure that we all are consistent and uniform with each other, we talk the same way, so we have uniformity in our discussions, in our writings, in our publications, in our grants. We don't use the abbreviation for the night ADRC. We don't say K-ADRC. This is uh, explicitly Mrs. Joanne Knight's wish that we term it the night ADRC. So nobody use KADRC as abbreviation. Night ADRC. We do not use the possessive eponym Alzheimer's. We use Alzheimer. Just the way Down syndrome is Down syndrome, not Down's syndrome. Alzheimer disease. DAT was a term, dementia of the Alzheimer type, that we used for many years, but in the biomarker era. We no longer say of the Alzheimer type, we say this is Alzheimer disease dementia. So we don't use DAT. We think our research volunteers are not there for us to, uh, uh, to ask them to be subjected to whatever we want to do. We want them to be part of our research program, so we don't refer to them as subjects. They are participants. We don't say participants that, uh, that is for an inanimate object, so it's participants who. No apostrophe is needed here, so we don't say somebody was born in the 60s, we say they were born in the 60s without the apostrophe. And finally, in, again in this biomarker era, I would say that we can move away from diagnoses that really represent syndromes and begin to use etiology. So we can be very mildly impaired, but we still can determine the etiology. So we don't use the term MCI. Uh, if I find any of you are using any of these uh, X'd out areas, uh, you will no longer be part of the KADRC. No. <laughs> Here's something that's difficult, uh, and many of you are, may be unaware of this. This is called PubMed Central ID, and we have to comply with this. When we publish a paper, even if it's published online, the NIH, NIH manuscript ID is provided. That gives us three months to the day to register this with the PMCID. And it takes about six weeks to get that PIMCD after the original ID is issued. You cannot assume that the journal in which your manuscript was published will take care of this for you. Some do, but some don't. And so someone must be responsible for the manuscript, the multi-authored, somebody must be responsible to approve the final version upload everything and have the final PMCID is issued. Now why is this important? Uh, and, and it applies to any uh, man, uh, publication in which our data have been used or our grants have been cited or our faculty are contributing. So it's very broad. Why is it important? Because each year we have to generate progress reports so that we get from the NIA our funding for the upcoming budget year. And the progress report requires that we list the references that have cited our work. If any of those references don't have a PMCID number, we don't get any money. Not just the person who failed to register this in PMCID, but the entire grant is not awarded for that budget year until everything is completed. So this is an important and little known uh, uh, issue that we must uh, pay attention to and must complete. If you have any questions, Krista Mulder uh, knows everything about this. So, uh, so 
uh, we hope that everyone, when you're planning projects and grants, that you will consult our biostatistics core not after the grant has been complete, or the study has been completed, and you have the data, and you want them to do the analyses, but early on, even during the design phase of the study. First, biostatistics can't fix a poor uh, study design if it's already been completed, but also they should be appropriately, when appropriate, it's not always appropriate, recognized with co-authorship if they've made an intellectual contribution to the work. And in fact, grant reviewers and the NIA note how frequently people from the Data Management and Biostatistics Corps are listed as co-authors. If it's a low percentage, then they interpret that as that our biostatisticians and data managers are not involved in the study. They didn't merit co-authorship. So pay attention to this. Uh, and of course, if they don't merit co-authorship, that's, that's fine. But when they do, if they get involved, please recognize that. And just last month, we had an external advisory committee for our two program project grants. And they looked at the summary statement for our program project, Healthy Aging and Senile Dementia, HASD. And they noticed that some of the projects were critiqued because it appeared to the reviewers as if the uh, statistics section was not really integrated into the project itself. Now what typically, ha I think this is wrong, but what typically happens is when we're developing the projects to go into our grants, Kenji Zhang, the leader of our data management mm -hmm. and biostatistics core, does the appropriate uh, analytic plan, power calculations, and so forth, and emails them to the project leader. Sometimes the project leader simply takes that, what Kenji mails, and just sticks it in without really uh, integrating it into the rest of the project. So I, I think we haven't failed to do what we should do. I think we haven't shown as well as we can that it will, uh, that uh, statistics, biostatistics is involved in a, in a major way. And we'll talk about this more because next year we have to develop the uh, renewal uh, application for our other program project grant, the Adult Children's Study, and we want to make sure that statistics is well integrated. So uh, this is our schematic of how we visualize uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, the symptomatic phase on the far right on the bottom lasts about seven to ten years and we stage the severity of dementia using the clinical dementia rating from very mild CDR 0.5 to severe CDR 3 and, and death. But the actual pathophysiology begins many years, decades. I think we used to say two decades, it may well be three decades prior to this symptomatic phase. So the symptomatic phase, when you know, we say Alzheimer's disease, people conjure up a person with dementia, and that's the end stage of the disease. The disease has been going on for decades prior to that. How do we know that? Because we have biomarkers. So we can tell with changes in the cerebral spinal fluid and the uh, A-beta-42 protein and amyloid imaging with PET and spinal fluid markers of tau that the pathophysiology is developing. Now, we hope that we can identify this preclinical phase, clinically silent, no memory and thinking problems, before this pathophysiology builds up to a point it starts to disrupt the nerve cell health, neuronal integrity, and the ways by which neurons communicate with one another, the synapses. Once that starts, we think people are inevitably resigned to have a loss of brain function and produce symptomatic Alzheimer's disease. So we're really uh, focused very much on this preclinical identification with the hopes that somewhere here we can identify optimal periods where we can intervene with mechanism-based drugs that will delay symptomatic Alzheimer's disease or, if we're very fortunate, even prevent it. So here's our unifying themes. Um, we think that biomarkers, we know that biomarkers can develop this preclinical AD in asymptomatic people. So we ask if people have 
preclinical AD based upon biomarker positivity, if they continue to live, will they all develop AD dementia? We don't know the answer to that. There may be protective factors that mean some people, even with the pathophysiology, will not develop dementia. Can we identify when people who are, have been cognitively normal and have preclinical AD when their, uh, when their synaptic and neuronal integrity has been breached? Can we tell that they're on the road to symptomatic Alzheimer's disease? And as I mentioned, we want to identify and characterize this very important condition for the benefit of optimizing prevention <coughs> trials using mechanism-based therapies in order to delay or prevent Alzheimer disease dementia. So I think most people here know this, that we evaluate our 900 volunteer participants every year in the Memory and Aging Project for their clinical and cognitive assessments. And all of those uh, assessments, as well as the many other procedures that we ask of our participants, including imaging, and blood draw, and spinal fluid, and uh, fibroblast harvesting, dermal biopsies, are supported by our grants. We have three major grants for uh, sporadic, non-dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease. The first is the ADRC grant itself. It first was funded in 1985, so we're presently in budget year 36. The number of the years changes depending on when the NIA actually issues the funds. And in 2010, uh, a, a very, a very generous couple, Joanne and Charles Knight, gave us a large endowment gift. And so the, ever since 2010, it's the Knight uh, ADRC. Uh, Chuck Grant unfortunately died of Alzheimer's disease uh, several years ago, but Joanne still very much involved and engaged in us uh, and uh, is very um, you know, special to all of us as well. The program project grant, Healthy Aging and Senile Dementia, began even prior to the ADRC grant. It first was funded in January 1984, and we're currently in budget year 36. It looks a little discrepant. The one grant started in 85 in budget year 36 and one in er year earlier, but also in 36. But that's, again, because of the way the NIA funds us. And then the adult children's study, people 45 years and older, began in 2005, and we're currently in budget year 14. Then we have a very important additional study of dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease, autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease, a very rare form of the disorder in which an individual inherits a mutated gene from their parent, and that mutation will absolutely cause Alzheimer's disease dementia in the offspring who inherited it, uh, and usually early onset, typically around age 45, sometimes in the 30s, sometimes even in the 20s. And that Diane grant now is in its 11th budget year. Grants are awarded for a five-year period at a time. Uh, each, at the end of uh, each budget period then, we have to reapply to the NIA and go through a competitive renewal process judged by study sections and peer review panels to see if what our progress has been to date and our plans for the future merit continued funding. So we must do this with each of these grants every five years. Uh, we think that we're in a good position, but we never know how a review panel will judge our work, so it's not given that we're always going to get renewed, except since 1984 when the HASD grant first was funded, each renewal cycle for each grant has always been awarded. This is a terrific track record of funding. It really uh, speaks to the uh, high quality uh, of the Knight ADRC and its affiliated grants to its faculty to its staff and to its participants. We had a participant meeting just this past Saturday and I indicated my totally, totally unbiased opinion that this is the best 
Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, and I really think it is, and much of it credit goes to all of you. And uh, let's see, yeah, so we submitted, for example, our HASD renewal submission last January 2018, it was reviewed in the summer and fall, and our funding began for the next five years just, this, uh, just last month, May 1, 2019. Okay, grant support, why do we need it? Well, I mean, the obvious things, we can't continue to follow our, um, our participants, our cohorts, unless we are, have the funding to support their assessments, so they must do this. It supports our, uh, our research programs, the actual research, and it supports the salaries of the faculty and the staff uh, to the degree uh, of, of their time and effort that they <coughs> devote to the, uh, to the work of the grants. And what may not be apparent, these grants also support our benefits. Uh, I didn't know, know this until I started uh, being the PI of some of these grants, but I thought that Wash U provided the coverage for our health, health insurance and for our retirement savings. I thought it was a very generous program by Washington University. It turns out they're not doing that. It, come, <laughs> it comes from the grants. So your, uh, your uh, benefits really are dependent upon the grants as well. The one thing we can't figure out quite yet is the, uh, the education benefit, tuition benefit may be handled separately. But everything that you get, not just your salary support, but your benefits, dependent upon having these grants uh, funded. I m mentioned HASD began May 1, 2019. Uh, here are the cores of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, program project. So administration, clinical biostatistics, neuropathology, and imaging, and four projects, again, all linked thematically around the theme of preclinical Alzheimer's disease and its characterization. What are the uh, factors that uh, help individuals uh, either resist or succumb to the uh, developing Alzheimer's pathology? So we're looking at molecular biomarkers, we're looking at sleep, the genetic architecture of people who seem to be able to tolerate the pathophysiology without developing dementia, and how can we assess people in a more uh, economical and reliable way than having them come in for a one and a half to two hour pen and paper assessment uh, every year. So we're looking at remote cognitive monitoring. I mentioned the uh, participants meeting held last Saturday at the Westport Doubletree Hotel at about 425 uh, individuals uh, participate and um, uh, those of you, and many I know, many of you were there on Saturday, uh, it's hard to uh, indicate uh, how much our participants and their families enjoy interacting with, communicating with our uh, faculty and staff and learning about the research to which they have uh, so, uh, so importantly uh, supported by their participation. So these are just some of the individuals who were there on, on Saturday. So what about the uh, characteristics of our clinical cohort? And I'm going to talk about people who are 65 and older, uh, the program project Healthy Aging and Senile Dementia and the Knight ADRC grant only enroll people who are 65 and older, and together those two grants have about 537 individuals. The ACS, Adult Children's Study, enrolls people 45 and older, but about a third of them are now 65 and older, but to all together, uh, supported by the Adult Children's Study grant, about 300 individuals. They range in age, if we include our Diane participants, seen at the Memory and Aging Project, from age 20 to age 103. So a remarkable opportunity to look at cognition and related factors throughout the adult lifespan. 50% are women, 16% are African American, and some of our participants are very, very dedicated. So uh, again, on Saturday, the person who has been volunteering for 32 years was front and center uh, in, the, in the program, right up front, so he could hear everything, He's very involved. So a remarkable group of individuals, and they come not just from Missouri and Illinois, but from all over, including 
places that seem far away from us. If we look at everybody 65 and older, ADRC, HSD, but also the individuals in adult children's study who are 65 and older, we have a total sample of about 700 individuals available for longitudinal assessment and they generate data and biospecimens uh, for research and they're uh, all very committed to that research goal. You can see their characteristics here, they're in their mid to late 70s, uh, well educated as a group and um, we have about, uh, about as I said, 16% African American all told. I mentioned multiple times how dedicated our participants are. We ask much of them in terms of biomarkers. Uh, we obtain Im imaging and cerebral spinal fluid biomarkers at baseline, their initial assessment, and every three years thereafter. And in the total registry, you'll see that uh, about 77% uh, have had an amyloid PET scan, 70% have had LP, lumbar puncture, to collect cerebral spinal fluid, and 84% have had a brain MRI. And many of these people uh, do contribute every three years longitudinally. So a, what is now called a very deeply phenotyped cohort, very valuable, not only for the 25% or so of our cohort who actually has mild Alzheimer's disease dementia, but for the three quarters of our cohort who are cognitively normal, and yet many of them, 33%, have developed preclinical Alzheimer's disease. So a very valuable cohort. Our adult children studies, uh, the re reason we call it an adult children study is because these individuals mostly are <laughs> there because they had a parent who was affected with Alzheimer's disease, so they're the children of their affected parent. Very, very, very uh, a committed group. You can see that uh, they uh, participate in biomarkers at an exceptional rate, even uh, at their second follow-up, six years after baseline, 84% have had amyloid PET, and 90% continue to have lumbar puncture, and 100% had brain MRI. There's some drop-off in the nine years after initial assessment, the third follow-up, and we'll be discussing this when we meet uh, this month to plan our renewal of our adult children's study, how to address uh, this drop-off. But there's no other study in the world like this. This is remarkable, unique, how people longitudinally have these molecular biomarkers. Another way our, uh, our participants show their support is they very frequently agree to brain autopsy should they die. We have an autopsy rate uh, in the past, in 2018, of 80%. Uh, it's higher than the other Alzheimer's disease centers average of about 60%. Particularly, we had eight out of nine control deaths come to autopsy. Uh, we had only one death in an African American, but that person was autopsy, so please note our autopsy rate in African American is 100%. <laughs> and this is a particular issue because, again, across the ADRCs, uh, it's about, about a third. So we pay great attention to getting autopsies not only in individuals with end-stage dementia, CDR3, but cognitively normal, CDR0.5 in African American. This is a great time to be in Alzheimer's disease research. For those of you who are investigators at the NIA, please look at these pay lines as the NIA budget has been increased, particularly for Alzheimer's disease. So yeah, I'll just have you look here that if you are a new investigator and you submit a grant that uh, is, uh, you ask for less than five, uh, $500,000 in direct cost for year one. If it's a non-Alzheimer grant, your pay line is 18, but if you're an Alzheimer investigator, it's 31. And for early stage investigators, also remarkable. Look at our program projects. That's what HASD and ACS are. For non-Alzheimer pay lines, it's 20. For Alzheimer related program projects, it's 38%. And you can also look for the uh, opportunities for training, uh, both K awards and the training grants 
and also the fellowship grants for the laboratory individuals. So please, if you've ever been considering submitting a grant under any of these mechanisms and it involves Alzheimer's disease, now is the time to do so. We submitted our renewal for the uh, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center grant just in April, April 25th. We're asking for another five years of funding. Uh, it would take us from May 2020 through April 30th, 2025. Uh, we add the budget for this uh, the next renewal phase is about uh, 15 million. Uh, the grant itself is 684 pages. Every bit of it is riveting reading. So <laughs> if you would like to see it, we'll give you a copy. Uh, but from, from the renewal, we found that we had almost 290 requests in the last budget period for access to our research volunteers, our participants, or their, and or their data and or their specimens. And we fulfilled those requests to investigators not only at WashU, but across the United States and internationally. And these requests themselves, uh, once we granted them and the investigators used the data, the specimens, whatever, generated another 43 million for those investigators in new grants. So that's what we're supposed to do as an Alzheimer's Center, support and foster and facilitate Alzheimer's research. So this is terrific. And from our own group, uh, we generated in the past five years, 584 uh, peer-reviewed uh, publications. This is what we submitted into the, uh, into, uh, the, pro, uh, into the uh, renewal application last April. Uh, there's, uh, for those of you who are, uh, know the ADRC, this is a new structure for us. Uh, the cores are the same. We have an administration core and we have a clinical core, a data management statistic core, neuropathology core, an outreach, recruitment, and engagement core. Those are what we have already, but we have to have a new core. It's called a biomarker core. It's mandated. This is was a little uh, problematic for us because we have an imaging core funded by HASD grant and a biomarker core already funded by the Adult Children's Study grant. So how can we add in a new uh, core and uh, Celeste Karch uh, has stepped up and she's going to be looking at uh, the dermal fibroblasts and, in, and induce them into uh, pluripotent uh, stem cells. So we have three biomarkers core, cores uh, at, of now. We also have a new component uh, called the research education component to facilitate training of uh, both trainees and junior faculty. Uh, the genetics core is currently a uh, genetics core, but is going to expand in the next renewal to genetics and high throughput omics core and be co-led by Carlos and Oscar. We also no longer in the ADRC will have pilot projects. We have been funding three uh, or s sometimes four pilot grants, one year pilot grants uh, each year for $30,000 a piece. The developmental projects will be for up to two years and will be for a, up to $100,000 a year. Um, and we think we can simultaneously at any one time fund two developmental projects. Since June of last year, these, uh, thanks to Krista, these are uh, grants that utilized uh, ADRC or are utilizing grant, uh, ADRC uh, 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 participants' data or biospecimens. Uh, so again, the uh, this is exactly what the uh, ADRC wants to do, is to facilitate and foster new research. So this is terrific uh, 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 track record, and congratulations to all of the investigators. And again, if you want to <coughs> become an Alzheimer investigator and uh, seek federal funding from the NIA, this is a great time to do it. When I introduce the uh, students who are here with us this summer, uh, I mentioned that we want to train the next generation of Alzheimer's researchers, and this is also the case for our early stage investigators, and we have uh, a terrific group of uh, individuals, both uh, uh, in training and fellows and, uh, and instructors and assistant professors. And we try to recognize them as they develop at different stages of their career. 
Uh, one such recognition is the Poletsky Education Award. It is uh, a long-standing award for us. And uh, last uh, fall, uh, uh, FAT uh, from uh, Dave Holtzman Lab, uh, M uh, MD, PhD student, was recognized with the Poletsky Award. The Coppola Award also is long-standing. And uh, this past uh, year, this spring, uh, Lenise Cummings Vaughn was recognized with the Coppola Award. And then the Blumenfeld Award is new, began just last year, and this year's awardee is Brian Gordon. So again, uh, we have just a, a very impressive group of junior and early stage investigators. I mentioned how valuable, how important our cohorts are. This is not something that is uh, unrecognized uh, throughout the world. It is very much recognized just in the past year. Uh, studies launched from Australia, the University of Melbourne, from Johns Hopkins University, from the University of California, San Francisco, from the University of Kentucky, and from the University of South Southern California, all are uh, having uh, the WASH U and the Knight ADRC deeply involved because of the value of our participants. So all of these studies will use participant data and biospecimens, uh, and we are, as I say, avidly sought because of the uh, very uh, precious uh, uh, data and uh, specimens that we can provide. Uh, we're in several multi-center studies as well. One is a, a longitudinal early onset Alzheimer disease study, the LEADS, looking at people who develop symptomatic Alzheimer's disease younger than age 65, but do not have a mutation, as I described for the Diane population. Greg Day is our site leader and is uh, well on track to enroll his target of 10 to 12 uh, individuals. We also are joining the Down syndrome world. Uh, you may not be aware that uh, every adult with Down syndrome, should they live to age 40, uh, has uh, Alzheimer's disease pathology, and uh, there's a high prevalence of developing Alzheimer's disease dementia uh, after age 40 in individuals with Down syndrome. So we are joining a, a NIA-funded program called the Neurodegeneration and Aging Down Syndrome Study, uh, and it's going to, uh, and, and our, our site here will be led by Bo Ansis and John Constantino, and we're going to be uh, joining, and, and this, this program is going to unite with another program in its renewal application to form the Alzheimer Biomarker Consortium in Down Syndrome, which we will join as well. So uh, we're uh, fortunate and pleased and gratified to have partners in our work. Uh, you can tell already we're pretty broad in our spectrum, but we have great uh, participants with whom we interact. The long-standing association of the Knight ADRC and the former St. Louis chapter, now Greater Missouri chapter, the Alzheimer Association continues. Uh, we interact with the Harvey Friedman Center for Aging, the Hope Center for Neurologic Disorders, the Barnes Jewish Hospital Foundation. Uh, we work hard to try to be more welcoming to people of color to become our research participants by far the greatest percent of underrepresented individuals in the St. Louis area are African American. About 13% of the greater metropolitan population is Afri uh, 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 who are 65 and older is African American. And so we worked very hard to do this, but frankly, we did a terrible job of this until we formed our African American Advisory Board in 2000, the inaugural uh, chair was uh, uh, Norman Say, and the current chair is uh, Pastor Doug uh, Petty. Uh, uh, these, indivi these individuals have uh, in, uh, individually and collectively um, counseled me uh, as to how I could be more culturally sensitive, but also our entire uh, ADRC. Uh, and they are extremely supportive of our work. As a matter of fact, many of them also are memory and aging project participants. So uh, I ha I'm going to try to do this in a way that I don't overlook people, uh, but um, 
uh, I often do overlook people, but I'll try to get everybody. So I'm going to ask members of our uh, African American board, uh, advisory board to stand when I call their names. Doug Petty, Karen Collins, Collins Lewis, Jesse Swanigan, George, Ham Joyce Hamilton, Beverly Foster. Stay standing, stay standing, stay standing. Uh, Richard King, C. Jessel Strong, Mary Harper Thomas. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Who did I overlook? I mentioned philanthropy. We get, uh, well, first we get excellent, superb support from Washington University and particularly from the School of Medicine and especially from the Department of Neurology. If you ever find yourself as a director of a large multi-component research program, please do as I do and have as your associate director your department chair. That goes a long, goes a long way. Dave Holtzman is a great, uh, great chair. Uh, alumni and development has been very helpful to us and our donors, I, I per particularly highlighted uh, the Knight family and Roger and Paula Riney. I'll talk about them in just a moment. The philanthropy part is very important because our NIA grants, even though we have been very successful in getting the grants, only covers about 70% of our research costs. So in the past year, uh, Joanne Knight and her family uh, I mentioned their generous, very generous endowment in 2010 provided us with an additional, additional very important gift, a very, very generous gift from Roger and Paula Riney it happened this year, and recently we had a, an endowed gift that uh, has gone to not only support uh, through the endowment income our research, but established a, um, a, uh, a chair uh, for, um, for Bo Ansys. So we're very pleased to have these uh, generous uh, supporters. All right, I am going to, and I've mentioned the uh, African American Advisory Board and how they've been instrumental to our efforts to be uh, more diverse and equitable in our approach of, and recruitment of everybody in the uh, St. Louis uh, area. I thought I'd spend a few minutes, uh, because as I said, I'm older and I think back on things and I don't always remember them correctly, but I try to remember them in a way that tells a reasonable story, whether it's true or not, I'll let you determine. Uh, but we, in one form or another, have been involved in the initial efforts to find treatments for Alzheimer's disease, almost 40 years. It began with three groups in Great Britain, uh, all reporting within the space of a year, uh, that there is a cholinergic deficit in the brains of individuals who died of Alzheimer's disease. So this was Peter Davies and his group, David Bowen and his group, and Elaine Perry and her group. So began the cholinergic hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease. It's a cholinergic deficit. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter important for many of the uh, memory pathways in the brain. And so if we're losing cholinergic input, can we boost it pharmacologically? Well tried to do that with replacement therapy the way uh, had been done just a decade earlier with Parkinson's disease, giving individuals dopamine, their depleted neurotransmitter, and treating people. We thought maybe we could do that in Alzheimer's disease. It turned out that using choline itself is not very good, so people looked uh, uh, at the in cholinesterase inhibitors. Acetylcholinesterase breaks down whatever uh, acetylcholine is released from the synapse, so if we could inhibit its breakdown, it would last longer, work longer. The very first cholinesterase inhibitor in Alzheimer's disease was something called Taclin, also known as THA. And it leads to a person I've never met, uh, but turns out to have had a major uh, uh, impact on the development of this hypothesis, and he was a, a Missourian, uh, went to uh, uh, University of Missouri Columbia and then came here for uh, medical school and stayed on at Barnes Hospital where he did his residency both in internal medicine and psychiatry. And he was interested in Tacklin. He was working with a man who was at the 
Missouri Institute of Psychiatry named Sam Gershorn in the 1970s, and they thought Tacrin might be able to treat people with delirium if it were in, uh, induced by uh, anticholinergic uh, overdose and, and found out that it worked. So Dr. Summers then said, well, maybe it will be important for treating other cholinergic related deficits, such as in Alzheimer's disease. So he got a patent in the late 70s to use Tacrin in Alzheimer's disease. He then moved to UCLA and he uh, reported in 1981 uh, that Tacrin administered intravenously seemed to help nine of 12 individuals from his private practice who he said had Alzheimer's disease. And then came a blockbuster. In 1986, he got a New England Journal Medicine report of the efficacy of Tacrin in senile dementia of the Alzheimer type. Now, I'm not casting aspersions, but any of you who have been around a while can look at his co-authors and you won't recognize any of their names. I don't know who these people are. They certainly were not part of the burgeoning Alzheimer investigators and uh, the Alzheimer community, but this was big, 1986, can treat Alzheimer's. But quickly, the Alzheimer community reacted and reacted very negatively. When you looked at that New England Journal of Medicine report, it was astonishing that it was accepted for publication. He did not describe his inclusion, exclusion criteria. He did not randomize people. He, how he said they improved, he didn't describe the methods he used to ascertain improvement. Some of the people didn't have Alzheimer's, had ALS. And he used other medications besides Tacrin. And it was most importantly, it was non-blinded. These were his patients. He was treating his own patients. So uh, after this uproar, uh, the Food and Drug Administration began investigating him and he no longer was uh, a member, uh, was, was part of the cholinergic hypothesis and cholinesterase inhibitor uh, field because he was under investigation. Formal charges for malpractice were never filed, but he was placed on the FDA's list of disqualified investigators until just fairly recently. I, as I said, I've never met him, but I uh, uh, know that he was not part of the community because uh, from 1984 to 1991, 28 uh, NIA-funded Alzheimer's disease centers were established, including one at his institution. He was not part of it. He eventually moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico. I think he's there today, and he's still looking at uh, therapy for Alzheimer's disease to, or to prevent cognitive decline, but now he's um, investigating a cocktail of 34 antioxidants. But he left a legacy. The uh, interest in Tacrin was real in the community, and there was a Tacrin study group initiated by Warner Lambert, and it was acquired by Park Davis, and neither of those firms are around anymore. But it, it started the very first multi-center trial of a drug, Tacrin, in people with Alzheimer's disease dementia, and they utilized eight established Alzheimer's centers and eight at least then, non-Alzheimer's centers. This was the first multi-center attempt. Everyone had to follow the same uh, selection criteria, the same assessment protocol, and uh, this was going on at the same time. There was a, a program called the Consortium to establish a registry for Alzheimer's disease, which also developed standardized and uniform assessment in instruments and it began to take those original ADCs that were very independent programs, never, never working together. Now they had to come together to use uniform diagnostic criteria, protocols, and so forth. This Tacrin study group uh, really set the stage a few years later to, for NIA to fund an Alzheimer's disease cooperative study comprised of all of the Alzheimer's centers and led by Leon Thal, who then was in San Diego, from 1991 until his death in 2007. But bringing all the Alzheimer's disease centers as CIRAD did and as the Tacrin Study Group did led to the current era in which ADNI and many other multi-center grants are, are working together with a uniform protocol. Mary Coates and I 
Uh, Leonard wanted nothing to do with, we were one of the eight ADCs that signed up for this uh, this drug, uh, this drug trial, and I remember uh, Mary con- confirmed that Leonard was not very interested, and another uh, member, very influ- influential member of our uh, study team, a psychologist, Martha Sturant, uh, wanted us not to participate because she was concerned that the drug could have not a positive effect, but a negative effect, and it would confound the longitudinal cognitive assessment of our participants, but Mary and I talked about it. We decided, yes, we'll sign up. We'll be part of this very innovative, ambitious study because we would get paid for by Warner Lambert, something we had heard about but never had before, brand new technology. We got a fax machine. (laughs) So that as soon as as we got our lab results, we could fax them to, uh, to Warner Lambert. And it turned out it's important because tacrin has a high rate of inducing hepatotoxicity. And the very first individual in the tacrin trial who developed hepatotoxicity was one of our participants. And remember, Mary, you called and you were concerned. Wow, it came with a big red flag on it. We had to contact the participant. And she and her husband were out in Colorado at a vacation spot, so we couldn't really get in contact with them. This, by the way, for those of you, 90% of you who weren't born in, in 1987, uh, there weren't cell phones then, so uh, we had to track this participant down to tell them to stop taking the tacrin. So that was, that was kind of an interesting uh, story. Well, it turned out tacrin worked, or seemed to work, and it got its own high-profile publications Uh, Here's the one in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, There are 16 authors uh, listed here, as well as the collaborative study group. I'm one of them, but there are six others I highlight in yellow who are still active in the field. Uh, Lon Schneider, Claudia Kawas, Dave Notman, Rochelle Doody, myself. All the other other 10 no longer are active in Alzheimer's. Some some are no longer alive. So it just shows that over a uh, 25-year period that uh, some people uh, remain, but uh, there's a great turnover in the investigators who are leading these uh, innovative studies. So uh, this was big news because it certainly at least suggested that the Summers report from 86 may have been true as well. The FDA approved Tacron. The trade name was Cognex. Uh, Warner Lambert was so excited they took the Uh, members of the study group and their spouses to Hawaii for a luau. Uh, I did not go, Mary did not go, but uh, many people went and they were having a a great time Uh, because this this was brand new. Um, But Tacrin turned out not to be, or Cognex turned out not to be very good. You had to take the pills four times a day, uh, had to monitor for that hepatotoxicity, and then newer, much better cholinesterase inhibitors were introduced. So as of 2013, you can't find Tacrin, at least in the United States. But Tacrin ushered in the era of pharmacotherapy. Uh, here are the newer um, uh, cholinesterase inhibitors, denepazil, rivastigmine, galantamine, and then another a neurotransmitter system, NMDA, the memantine. That was in 2003. Since then, we've had no other approved therapies for Alzheimer's disease and the field recognizes that none of those drugs, denepazil, rivastigmine, galantamine, memantine, really provide clear-cut benefit for participants. So we're lacking really effective therapies. So that brings me to the amyloid cascade hypothesis, and again, most of you would never have been alive in 1992, but it came out as a big deal in 1992, John Hardy, uh, 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 trainee Allison Goat in 1991 reported the first uh, genetic cause of Alzheimer's disease, a mutation like dominantly in, uh, causing dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease, that was in the amyloid precursor protein gene. So he developed this amyloid hypothesis and he reached out to a colleague, George Higgins, and they wrote this up. And they said Alzheimer's disease is initiated by amyloid deposition. Uh, all the mutations that cause autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease in, increase the amount of the highly aggregable form of 
uh, A beta, A beta 42. Down syndrome, as I already mentioned, has a, uh, a high uh, prevalence, very high prevalence of Alzheimer's disease because they have three amyloid precursor protein genes rather than the normal two, so they're always overproducing amyloid beta throughout their life. And uh, APOE4, the major susceptibility gene, gene uh, plays a role in A beta metabolism. So all of these suggest that there really is a uh, uh, amyloid uh, is key uh, in, in the initiation of Alzheimer's disease. By the way, uh, how many here have heard of John Hardy? Anybody here heard of John Hardy? Okay. Anybody here heard of George Higgins? Yes? Oh. <laughs> Before this, anybody here, George? So he quickly, like Summers, went into obscurity. It turns out he had, he had published a Nature paper showing a mouse model that not only produced amyloid plaques but also neurofibrillary tangle degeneration. And right after he published this with John Hardy, his Nature paper got retracted because no one could reproduce his mouse model. And I haven't heard of him since either. So. Well, as we said, we've tried to attack what we think are the molecular pathology of Alzheimer's disease, including with anti-amyloid therapies. They've all failed. This is just a partial list, but just this past year, the bottom two, gantanarabab and aducanarabab, are failed, even though we had high hopes for them. And it's not just anti-amyloid therapies have failed, uh, but non-amyloid drugs, uh, uh, looking at uh, statins, looking at inflammation, looking at uh, insulin, they've all failed too. We have no effective therapies for Alzheimer's. Why? Well, maybe the drugs don't work, I don't think that's right. I mean, for amyloid, the anti-amyloid immunotherapies reduce the amount of amyloid in a participant's brain. So this is baseline of the trial of gantanarabab. Here's an amyloid PET scan of someone at baseline, and maybe they have less at week 52. I think you can see by here, this individual has marked reduction, and this individual almost 75%. So I think the drugs have target engagement, and they do reduce amyloid, but it doesn't benefit the patients. So why is that? Maybe the doses are too small. Uh, sometimes uh, the enrolled people they thought had Alzheimer's disease, but they do not. But maybe the therapy is too late. And so that brings us back to the uh, uh, preclinical Alzheimer's disease hypothesis. We want to treat with these drugs prior to having so many neur neurons damaged uh, by the time the symptoms occur in the entorhinal cortex, which is highly vulnerable to the Alzheimer process, 50% of neurons are gone, lost. So it's, in a way, if we wait to treat, when people have symptoms, we're trying to treat an irreversibly damaged brain. So we'd like to intervene at the preclinical stage. Uh, Randy Bateman and now Eric McDade are leading the dominantly inherited Alzheimer network trials unit, the first prevention trial, giving drugs to people without dementia, cognitively normal individuals. It started here at Washington University in 2012. A sister organization of Alzheimer's Prevention Initiative, very similar, began in 2013. And then for sporadic, non-dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease, another trial, a prevention trial began in 2013. So uh, the updated amyloid cascade hypothesis is that uh, we want to still target amyloid beta, but at a stage uh, before there is uh, the, all the copathologies and neuronal uh, loss that uh, comes later. So I'm going to conclude. Uh, this is the state of the ADRC. We're in terrific shape. We are terrific investigators, wonderful staff, the best participants. This is just a tremendous place to work. We are a world leader. And I think our uh, faculty, staff, participants, our outpatient clinic is remarkable. Uh, I think a lot of this happens because we are at Washington University, which is fosters and promotes collegiality and collaboration. We have been benefited by two remarkable executive directors, Virginia Buckles and Krista Mulder. It's not that we don't have concerns. Uh, I've mentioned what a great faculty we have. They often are asked to 
uh, come to other programs. In, in the past five years, uh, Mark Diamond, Allison Goat, Dave Brody, John McConaughey, and Yi Su have all been recruited elsewhere, and uh, I'm sure that will continue. I mentioned participant burden. We ask a lot of our participants. They are remarkable, but we have to always consider this so they don't fatigue and uh, refuse to come back for longitudinal follow-up. Um, so I've asked all of the night ADRC leaders of all the cores, all the projects to identify junior individuals who can be groomed for succession planning and I'm uh, certainly part of that and I've been giving a lot of thought about who I wish to succeed me, but should I step down or when I step down as director of the night ADRC and I've identified two individuals I'm putting a lot of time and effort into, uh, my two grandsons, uh, Jack and Thomas. So yeah, I don't know if you can see, there. I'm reading them from the Knight ADRC procedures manual. <laughs> they always ask for it. So with that, I thank you and uh, see if there are any questions. Thanks very much.